Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome audience to another episode of the Talk in Deen podcast. I'm your host Majid and I have with me today Brother Rash and Brother Modi. How are you doing brothers? Alhamdulillah, uh, can't complain. Uh, the weather could be better. I do like your uh, cabin that you're sitting in. MashaAllah, it's very beautiful. <laughs> and I, I wish I had one as well. <laughs> Brother, you could join me man. I would no, do, otherwise it, I wouldn't be sitting here on this side of the fence. <laughs> he, he can't now, He's like, he must be in tier three, so he has to stay home. Tier three, yeah. that's it. Shackled in my own home, just like the occupation of Israel. Yeah, well, uh, we will be discussing uh, a lot of that today. Um, but, uh, but generally, I mean, uh, Rash, you mentioned earlier when we were speaking about endless debates in regards to what's happening with Fran- in France at the moment. Yeah, some of it's been productive, some of it less so. But yeah, there's a lot of discussion about obviously what's happening in France and these cartoons and how Muslims should react to them. Um, to be fair, just very quickly, I listened to a couple of khutbas by a couple of people. I won't mention names, prominent people. And they actually were both quite good initially. But sadly, both of them, and these are very prominent people, both of them then don't give any type of solution towards the end. So. Um, it's sad really because that's the discussion that's happening on the ground I've been discussing to brothers and sisters about you know what's happening in France Um, everybody's feeling that tension because of how things are going but you know we should know what the Islamic perspective is on things like that and how to elevate the thinking of our ummah Um, but again there's some productive discussions as well so hopefully they'll be for the beneficial of of all of us really inshallah yeah, alhamdulillah. I mean, uh, uh, loads of stuff's happening at the moment. Obviously, we did a, a podcast on France just a couple of weeks ago, but things have, uh, you know, uh, uh, escalated a little. Mm. And, um, you know, it's something maybe we can cover uh, in a future podcast. But the discussion for today's podcast is, is very, very important. Um, and it's something which a lot of Muslims are speaking about. And this is to do with the uh, so-called normal, normalization with the, the uh, state of Israel, um, also known as the usurping entity. So what we see is yesterday there was uh, the announcement made by Trump about uh, Sudan uh, being the next uh, Muslim Arab country to recognize and normalize relations with, uh, with Israel. And, uh, you know, a lot of people right now are asking the question, about where Saudi fits into this, uh, Saudi Arabia. And that's the main discussion for today's topic. Um, So what we can see is that in in a bit of a a timeline is that in August, on August the 13th, uh, the UAE, uh, they announced that they're gonna normalize relationships with with Israel. And uh, this normalization, this agreement is called the Abraham Accords Peace Agreement, okay? And um, the, and what I further said was that the Treaty of Peace, Diplomatic Relations and Full Normalization between the United Arab Emirates and the State of Israel. And then we see on September 15th, Bahrain also uh, followed and, um, you know, there was the signing of the Abraham, uh, Abraham Accords. And uh, a lot of people have been saying at this stage that who's next? especially since uh, on September the 29th uh, at the UN General Assembly, Netanyahu, uh, he, uh, he, he made a statement and he said that no doubt that more Arab and Muslim countries will be joining the circle of peace soon, very soon. So even when the initial issue with UAE began, what we see is that uh, people were looking towards Saudi Arabia because even though, you know, we've seen what MBS has been doing over the last couple of years, generally people still see Saudi Arabia as like the center of Islam, you know, because of Mecca and Medina. And, uh, you know, the, the, the eye, all eyes were on Saudi Arabia, what are they going to do? And what we see is that Saudi Arabia actually did come out with a statement uh, after the UAE had uh, sort of normalized relationships and what they said is that Saudi Arabia isn't going to follow in the footsteps of the UAE or even Bahrain later on um, until the issue of uh, the Palestinians is resolved. And what they actually said was that uh, a peace accord with the Palestinians has to be established. 
So this is what we see at the moment, the, the situation with Saudi Arabia and the situation with the normalization process. And there's two questions that I think are very important that we need to discuss. The first one is many people are saying that Saudi Arabia and uh, most of the other Arab countries actually have normalized relationships like behind the scenes with Israel uh, for a long time. It's been happening, right? And the other issue is also that the Saudis came out, and not just the Saudis, other Muslim countries have also said that there cannot be any uh, relationships with, with Israel, no normalization with Israel, until there is a peace process with the Palestinians, and uh, namely this is the two-state solution. Mm -hmm. So the two questions that I think we need to address is, first of all, is it that there's already de deals between the Saudis and the Israelis that have been going on for a while? And secondly, this peace accord that the Arab countries and, uh, and other Muslim countries talk about with Israel, is this something which, as Muslims, we accept? Uh, is this something that we should be working towards and so on? So firstly, let's, let's discuss the issue of Saudi Arabia and Israel. So if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna ask you guys, has there been uh, a relationship between these countries uh, for a long time and certainly since UAE came out with the fact that they're going to normalize relationships? I mean, for me personally, I think one of the first things we need to kind of also do is define what we mean by normalization because normalization in different contexts results in different things. <clears throat> And just for the audience's benefit, defining, you know, what we mean in terms of normalization in the Arab sense and also normalization in the Saudi sense. Because one of the things that's quite important to understand is that Saudi is seen as the leader of the Muslim world, especially the Sunni world, right? And when it takes leadership, it also brings people alongside, or, uh, along with it. Well, in this case, <coughs> Saudi is playing a kind of a double-edged sword game. So on one hand, it's obviously operating from behind the scenes and making deals, which I do believe it is, because various different reports which state <coughs> that it has recognised Israel, but it's not just ready to come out and have those, uh, you know, discussions formally in front of, you know, uh, uh, the public view. Um, but going back to my point in terms of like normalisation, <coughs> so if, just for the audience's benefit, rather than, you know, my and Russia's uh, benefit, Normalization is where what they are trying to do is basically trying to reignite and answer uh, and settle the issue of uh, Palestine as a whole, right? So it means having those diplomatic relationships with Israel, which was actually uh, forced and established back in 1948, 14th of May. And what normalization means is they are going to literally kickstart the economic relations and also at the same time kill any aspiration of the Palestinians. So there won't be no Palestine. That's the key thing to understand, right? And linking it to the question that you posed, Mazd, can will Saudi recognize? Now, this is the sticking issue why Saudi is hasn't been the first one to come out mm -hmm. and it hasn't led from the front. It's almost operating from behind. Why? Because for them to come out and say, okay, there won't be no Palestine. Imagine the shockwaves that will send to the Ummah at large, especially the Palestinians who have been fighting this conflict since the initiation of Israel back in 48. And to point when I say initiation of Israel in 48, that was when it was formally announced, where it was initiated, right, back in late 18th century, right? So the Balfour Treaty was there. The discussions that were held between the Zionists and uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's only a matter of time when Saudi does come, up, uh, come out openly uh, in terms of like UAE, Bahrain, now with Sudan, obviously America being the global superpower, it has given them incentives, right, to come out and recognize Israel, right? It's not just about what's his name, <coughs> you know, recognizing Israel and normalizing, you know, uh, economic and trade deals with them and having that, you know, business as usual concept. It's also about... <coughs> How do we opt and uh, operate as a single you know, group to fight Islam? Uh, so there's a number of key things which Saudi is currently evaluating, 
what Bahrain, UAE, Sudan and all the other countries have done is given it something to say, OK, this is going to work and that's not going to work. Almost like a you know, trial and error situation or testing the waters amongst his own populace. Right. And they have come out with statements, uh, statements to uh, say, look, we need to differentiate between the Palestinian issue and the national interest. Saudi and everyone else is selling this as a national interest and something which will benefit the Arab world and the Muslim world. Yep. But we also need to keep in mind that it's separate from the Palestinian issue. But when as Muslims, when we have Islam as our basis and our framework, we recognize actually, you know what, there is no such thing as such thing as national interest because these nationalistic borders and entities were implemented on the back of Sykes Pico, right? For us, the Palestinian issue is an issue for the Ummah. And if Saudi is going to take the leadership of the Ummah, like it should do, right? Then it should use Islam as its basis. And the reason, like I mentioned before as well, why it hasn't come out openly is because it's not using Islam as the basis to resolve the situation. It's trying to work out and mitigate the response that it's going to get back from its populace, which won't be in accordance of what it has in plan, right? And just to add uh, or to make a point, I think that last part of what you said, Mudi, is is the bit that probably needs some clarification for the for people listening. Is that this idea of there will be people who might be pro Saudi? Who are thinking look Saudi haven't been one of the first people to come forward but it's as Muddy's just saying there is playing that role from behind and making sure other kind of regimes other nations can come forward and test the waters for them like your Bahrain and your UAE that doesn't mean that Saudi aren't also wanting to carry out the same action they're just utilizing those other nations to see from a public opinion point of view how they can further this agenda so in terms of you know behind the scenes as there been a normalization you can see by the actions of those other ally states that there has been you can also see to add to that the opening up of airspace to allow flights to come over from Israel to UAE over Saudi Arabia, that in itself is a degree of normalization. And the fact that these discussions are happening, and was it the, you know, the, the Imam of the Grand Mosque, Sudais, Sudais. When, Sudais, when he did that khutbah about talking about the Jews and how you treat your neighbors well and almost presenting a positive view of how to deal with the Jews that was seen as, again, testing the water. So just because Saudi haven't been the first to come forward and say, yes, we're going to normalize, they recognize it's a, it's a slightly longer game than that. And they do have ties, but those are not being presented in the forefront just yet. I think Absolutely. What, I think what I mean, we have seen is uh, the, the fact that they have been testing the waters, like you said. There was, uh, in Ramadan, there was a drama that was shown called Um Harun. No, yeah. uh, it was uh, uh, showing, um, you know, simp- a Jewish a Jewish midwife in a, a midwife in a sympathetic way. Um, but what that was doing is it was sort of like um, linked to making people feel uh, look at Israel in a different light. Then you had the sermon that you mentioned. Then you also you had the uh, uh, Muhammad Al uh former Saudi minister, who went to uh, visit Auschwitz. Um, but one thing I just want to add as well is that. You know, when you talk about Saudi allowing them to fly over the airspace and suppliers, one thing that you guys mentioned, uh, well, Moody mentioned when he he spoke spoke about normalization to the economic point of view and stuff like this. But I think there's one thing that's really, really key that probably needs needs to be explained. And the word normalization is, um, I think, in reality, it's recognition. Because from an Islamic and a Muslim point of view, the stance uh, hasn't been the fact that we won't have any military ties or any any uh, economic ties with Israel. From an Islamic point of view and Muslim point of view, it's been a case that we don't even recognize this entity. You understand? This entity, we don't recognize. Hence why, you know, you wouldn't allow a uh, an entity to fly over your airspace, which you don't even recognize as an example, right? So that's why even though someone might say, well, so what if they let them fly over the airspace? It's massive because beforehand, the, the stance has been that 
Palestine, all of Palestine, is the land of the for the land of the, the Muslims and for the Palestinians, and this has not been illegally occupied, and we don't recognize this entity which they call Israel. But what we see now is that with all these small things that are happening, in fact, is pointing towards recognition. And I don't really want to make a point. I just want to make one final point as well that I was thinking about. You know, we mentioned Sudan is going to recognize Israel, UAE. I think it's better to say the rulers of Sudan, mm. the rulers of the UAE, the rulers of Bahrain, yep. rulers of X, Y, and Z, because I'm, I know Sudanese people. And I can tell you for a fact that no one is happy on the ground for this. Definitely. Especially in Sudan. UAE is a bit of artificial reality anyway, to be honest with you, right? It's like, you know, made up of mostly uh, non-Emiratis, right? So it's a bit of a different society. It's a bit of an artificial society. Sudan is a society which is very conservative, which generally would not agree to this. I think it's very important that when we do mention it, we do make it clear that it's the regimes, the rulers that are signing these deals and not the people. No, you're absolutely right. And I think that's a brilliant point that you mentioned and highlight because one of the things or the objective of this podcast is to illustrate to the people that we are trying to unite the ummah, one ummah, right? And then kind of like, you know, almost boxing people into different groups such as the Sudanese and the Bahrains, which is sometimes an innocent mistake that anyone can make and mm -hmm. it's good to be corrected because what it does do is it shows, I mean, you know, the scars that we've got on our backs from you know, the sykes Pico and the divisions mm. and the sec uh, secretarian lines that they have uh, you know, divided us upon. So it's good to kind of like, you know, get a reminder of those kind of things. And hopefully, inshallah, over the course of the future, it will change and transform our mindsets and give us you know, the right answers and you know, the things that we need to undertake in terms of actions. But the other thing that I want to also kind of like, uh, highlight and uh, mention, and it links into your point about you know, the implications Okay, it's not just about, you know, resuming ties, etc. Uh, uh, the implications is a key uh, thing in, in trying to understand how this will unfold and what its real impact on the Ummah and the Muslims is. So one of the things when people are saying, you know what, and the leaders uh, or of these regimes, right, or uh, countries, when they do go into this normalization mode and have those natural, start building those natural ties with Israel, that's almost saying that, you know what, all the people that Israel, right, in quotes, has <coughs> expelled from their own homes. They have no right to return to their own land. Mm -hmm. That's what it's saying, right? Exactly. And it's also recognizing that no crime has been committed by the state of Israel. Yep. And thirdly, is legitimizing the birth of a nation state on the land of the Muslims to, and to say it's been legitimate. Exactly. And the blood and the sacrifices that the Ummah and the Palestinians have made, actually they were in vain. And also then inadvertently stating that, you know, people like Swahudin Ayubi and Nuruddin Zengi, all the things that they did historically to liberate the land, because they say land has a significance amongst the Muslims, because Beit al-Muqaddas is there, has been in, you know, it was fruitless, it was futile, right? That's the implication, right? And then, you know, even though America, and the Saudis and the Israelis, if they do give you economic incentives and do try to, you know, <coughs> wipe off your debts like the Sudanese have come out and said, and do remove you from, you know, the list of state sponsored terrorism list, what you have to recognize and instill in your mind is that, you know what, you will be questioned about this on the day of judgment, right? If you do try to back and defend this, that's the implication. So it's not just a worldly implication, it's also an implication on your hereafter because Allah will question you. Right, and for the Ummah, sometimes that notion doesn't occur because they've almost like been accustomed to living in a secularist world which is separating religion from life, and they don't, they don't have this concept of the hereafter that we won't be held accountable. And they always assess and judge things from the here and now and in terms of the political reality of the world. But our political reality as Muslims has to always be tied to the hereafter because we are an ideological group of people, a nation that has Islam, which is his mabda, right? So these are the implications that people also need to consider. It's not just about having, you know, trade deals and opening up the fly zone between mm -hmm. Israel and the other countries. Uh, it's not about your national interest, right? Um, it's more than that that's at stake, right? And, and there's many verses to even like 
you know, back that as well. So some of the verses where Allah uh, stipulates, uh, 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 and also the Prophet kind of concluded a treaty oh, with the sorry. Jews, the first treaty between the Jews and the Muslims, right, in Medina. And in that treaty, he stipulated that the Muslims are one nation to the exclusion of all others. So he excluded, right, the Jews from this. Today we're building treaties and they're calling it, uh, like you mentioned, Rash, the Abrahamic Accords. Mm. And if you look at the word itself, Abrahamic, it means people of one, you know, origin, mm. right? Mm. The Abrahamic religions or faiths, meaning mm. we are all the children of Israel, I mean, Abraham, right? Yep, to a certain point, it might be, you know, true. But in reality, the Ummah is one Ummah to the exclusion of everyone else. And if you are trying to challenge and promote some of these ideas, then just remember the verse. In Surah Al Anfal, where Allah says, the unbelievers spend their wealth to hinder man from the path of Allah. Oh. Yep, and they will continue to spend. Yep, and then on the day of judgment, they will have, have regrets and they will sigh. Yep, when they will be held accountable and raised. Right? Meaning that if you are trying to hinder and direct, you know, the real emotions and the willpower of the ummah to something that's artificial and incorrect, then you know what? There's a serious accountability on the shoulders of. Uh, these leaders and anyone who backs this that's the implication so, so what about this then you know um, you mentioned earlier about uh, the UAE and Bahrain uh, going ahead obviously Saudi because of the position it holds holding back a bit right what we've noticed is that you know the the treachery of the Bahrainis and the the Emiratis have been so, is so clear that you know some people have said that, even though they didn't recognize this, but they said that even when Jordan and Egypt had a peace deal with the state Israel, some people don't accept it, but they say still, they were bordering, they were bordering the country, they had a war, and you know what I mean? It's like there, there was a bit more to it, the fact that there could have been a deal. But there's a, there's Bahrain, a degree of pragmatism that they probably gave, excuse them for. Exactly, but you, know, you can see where maybe where they're coming from, but UAE Bahrain is just totally... So it's so far away from, from Israel, you can't use that excuse. And also another thing is even in these Abraham Accords, okay, there's no reference to Palestine. There's no reference. It's like, it's like the deal that was done was done in a way where the, the Israelis, they, have, they, had, they never had to make any concessions. They had never had to agree to even leave one centimeter of the Palestinian land or even to remove any... It was just a free deal. Now... When Saudi comes on the scene, you see where the where they may be tricking people is they're showing that yeah Saudi's not accepted this. You know why? Because Saudi's saying we will only accept this if there is a peace for the Palestinians, if there's a peace accord. Okay, so I want to speak a bit about, or, or I think we should speak a bit about the peace accord because what some people sometimes you do see with Muslims, maybe because of just the way the situation is, or maybe because they haven't got the knowledge. But you do have Muslims also promoting the issue of two-state solution. So if the Saudis or the Pakistanis and all these people are saying, look, we will recognize Israel when there's a state for the Palestinians, their capital is in East Jerusalem, etc., etc., right? Um, what people think is, yeah, you on one hand, you got the pure sellouts, which are the, the Emiratis and the Bahrains and the Sudanese, for example, you, who sold out for money, right? But the Saudi stance is one where at least the Palestinians are getting something back. So I think it's worth discussing what the two-state solution is, and the reality of this two-state solution, because I, I think that there are Muslims out there who actually are okay with this settlement. What, what do you guys think about that? You know, let me just add a, a couple of things to that, just based on your question, really, is... Uh, that sentiment, I think, has come from the fact that most of us have been brought up in a generation and where we haven't, you know, we, all we've ever known is the place being bombed, the place being, you know, m Muslims in living in terror, open air prison, all of the difficulties. Every Ramadan or every few Ramadans are sisters facing destruction. So it's quite natural for someone to think just from a pragmatic point of view that anything which saves the blood of a muslim yeah anything that is going to give them a degree of you know tranquility for a period of time or just some protection for a degree of time and not continue to be bombed is is progress 
Yeah, so that's what I think a lot of Muslims then see and go, okay, maybe a two-state solution, which gives, even if it's the, you know, and we'll talk about this specific, um, what has been presented as part of this deal, a part of this deal of the century. But even if it is um, a state which just gives them a degree of protection, that is better than what's happening at the moment. And for most Muslims of our generation, it's like, okay, that's better than nothing. And that's where I think there's this sentiment amongst some Muslims, I'm not saying all, some Muslims to think that maybe this two-state solution is the only way to give Muslims that degree of protection and you know, for them not to continue to suffer. That's where it's come about from. But then when we talk about what they mean by this two-state solution, which has evolved over time, you know, what it meant by that. Now, what there's being referred to w within this deal of the century that, that we're talking about is not even a two-state solution. It's a one-state solution. It's a solution that is um, allowing Israel to usurp the rest of Palestine when they've already usurped the majority of it and then throwing the Palestinians out into other areas um, in order to have a degree of autonomy. But even then, what autonomy? They can't have their own military. They can't have their own proper airspace. So it's absolutely bogus. So anybody who did think that this two-state solution is some sort of a, a solution, um, I think they need to kind of step back a little bit, look at the international scene and realize that this is just, this is just a, a deception. Yeah, I mean, just to add, you know, like when they do talk about two-state solution, in uh, you know uh, in congress but the republicans and the democrats have recognized and they actually use and state that look this is only a uh, one state solution right and there's many quotes uh, about this which people can dig up on the internet right it's a single state solution what the proposal is in regards to normalization and we do use the term normalization in the deal of the century but i would recommend and encourage everyone to read the document which was put together by gerard kushner right because he's the one who just devised this uh what you call it entire initiative and the policy and the framework and and the roadmap on how it's going to work and it's built on the back of the marshall plan the marshall plan for the audience's benefit is a plan that uh, the americans came up with after World War II and how Europe was almost like you know, annihilated and disintegrated and how to rebuild Europe on the back of a war. And they've taken, you know, the framework and the approaches that were used to rebuild Europe and Germany, I bringing it into, you know, uh, within their own orbit, and they've applied it to the Israeli and the Palestinian issue. And in regards to the two-state solution, I think we're giving it credibility that the Palestinians will have a land. Like I mentioned before, it means no land for the Palestinians. The whole of the current Palestine, i.e. let's reverse it all the way back to 1924 after the demise and the collapse of the Ottoman state, that Palestine will no longer exist. That's what two-state solution means. The land that is being offered to the Palestinians is the land that will be in Egypt, in places like Jordan. So it's land that belongs to the Muslims already. They are not getting any further land. Right, the whole of Palestine then naturally becomes um, part of Israel, which is what Israel's, Israel has always wanted, and hence why Netanyahu said, I could have never even imagined this in my wildest dreams. Right, it's unimaginable, inconceivable. Right, and it's also articulated in that same document, Peace to Prosperity, this Gerard Kushner's document, where he says, Why, and this is the actual you know, language that's listed in that document. And it's quite, you know, like surprising because it's quite blatant. Yeah, the Arabs are kind of like trying to operate behind the curtains because they're scared. But the Kufar, you know what? They're open. They're quite, you know, brave at the moment. Right? This is the type of leadership that we do have amongst ourselves. He said, while the Palestinians have never, the word never, had a state, they have a legitimate desire to rule themselves and chart their own destiny. You're talking about a two-state solution to legitimize Israel an illegitimate entity, right? And you're telling me that the Palestinians have never had a state. That's the reality, right? And unfortunately, right, you know, it's been embellished, this whole discussion has been embellished around economic ties, right? The benefits that the Muslim countries will have by having these trade relationships and how sanctions will be removed from their shoulders by the US and others. Right, and then all of a sudden, this, this uh, you know, 
prosperity will be born for the Palestinians and the Muslims at large. But in reality, it's a devious plan, a deceptive plan that tries to kill the nation. And this concept of two-state solution doesn't really exist. The two states that do exist, it means Israel gets everything in its entirety. The Palestinians will sacrifice their entire land. But then the other Muslim countries who've never had to sacrifice their own land will also have to sacrifice their land to create an artificial Palestine. That's you know, what... You know, Jazakallah, and um, I sort of bang on. And I think with the two-state solution, I think it's, this is something which is a lesson for the Ummah. And what I mean by this is that in reality, when the Ummah has looked to the United Nations, when the Ummah has looked to uh, states to be, you know, uh, their reference point in dealing with their problems, we see that this has just increased the humiliation. Now, if you think about the two-state solution, just think about this now. Originally, Palestine has been a problem for the Ummah. Then it became, you know, an Arab issue. Then, you know, when, I'm sure it's in 1974 when uh, uh, Yasser Arafat gave, delivered his speech at the UN and the so on PLO became like the sole representative of the Palestinian cause. And then it became your, your you know, your Fatah on one side and your Hamas on the other side. And what we've seen is that all this time, the issue has been taken away from an Islamic issue, right? Now, whilst this is happening, we see that these same people who do, don't own Palestine, for example, uh, Hamas, not Hamas, sorry, um, uh, PLO, they then sign these deals with the Israelis about a two-state solution and stuff like this, right? They had no authority to do so. But if you think about it, and what has the two-state solution done? All it's done is initially the Muslims in that land, in, around in that area, even the armies to a certain degree, not the rulers though, they wanted to liberate Palestine, okay? And what you do is that first of all, you take the issue away from them and you give it to the, the uh, factions like the PLO. But secondly, all that's happened in this two-state solution is that first of all, it kills the aspiration of people to liberate the entire Palestine, okay, because there's a two-state solution. But secondly, we, the Muslims are being uh, duped by this two-state solution. All this has done has allowed the Israelis to keep taking more of the land, mm -hmm. more of the land, more of the land, up to the stage when actually there can't be a two-state solution because the other people don't even have any land to have a state on, right? So, Can I... Absolutely. And maybe, maybe, so just one, one last thing, buddy. Maybe there was never a real desire for a two state solution. You understand? May, you know, you don't know. I'll give you one last example, and buddy, you make a point. Look at the issue of Golan Heights. The Golan Heights had UN soldiers at the Golan Heights. What did what happen? Uh, the Americans declared, yeah, that you Golden Heights, we recognize it as part of as part of Israel, right? Now, what did those UN soldiers do in that area? All they did was prevent the Syrians from taking that land, right? So whenever, whenever we've looked for these organizations or these people for our solutions for our problems, in fact, this has just increased our humiliation. And this should be a lesson that we should we need to learn as an Ummah. I mean, generally, like you say, you know, it's increased our uh, humiliation. But for me, the key thing is, and I think every time we've entered into negotiations with Israel and others, right, it's not just increased our humiliation. Instead, what we've committed to, the Ummah, it's never been reciprocated and we've never had anything in return, right? The uh, Jewish entity, right, when uh, the uh, Zionists went up to Sultan Abdul Hamid II, right? Brilliant example. They try to offer him all sorts, money, wealth. Well, like they uh, try to offer the Prophet Sallam, right? And they even like, said, we will wipe out the debts of the Ummah. And he never gave up because he said, it's not mine to give up, it belongs to the Ummah. And they've shed blood and tears for this, right? So it's not mine to give, which is the right, right response. Then from that point onwards, the Muslims feeling sorry for, you know, what happened to the Jews in uh, Germany, gave him access. Then what happened as a result is the people that did enter, they were pretty much general people with political motives, right? And what they did was they set about setting up Israel. An army was established, right? 
then they had that 1946 war, which was uh, where America, Britain, and all these other nations gave it the necessary defense and discussions happened and occurred. And then the Palestinians lost a certain level of land. They had to legitimize the presence of the Jews in uh, Palestine, right? And then you had all these other subsequent wars. Then in the 67 war, another thing happened, right? The uh, Israelis supposedly defeated the Arabs in a six day war. Yeah, if you look at the details, you realize actually, you know what, they never defeated them. What happened in the 1967, uh, what you call it, war was, it really established Israel's monopoly on the Muslims and uh, especially within Palestine. It took Golan Heights, it took the Sinai, etc. And then the Muslims had further discussions. And like you mentioned, Maj, uh, I mean, uh, Maj, Camp David Accords in the 70s. The Camp David Accords was a way, right, of saying, do you know what? You, Egypt, if you recognize Israel, we will give you Sinai back, right? How's that being reciprocated? We're just giving the taking, mm. right? And then obviously Sadat comes along. He had no, obviously, you know, emotional ties to the Ummah and the people on the ground. And he completely sold it, you know, the Palestinians and the Muslims, right? Fast forward, you had a guy who's the liberator of Palestine. That was the label that he used to walk around with, Yasser Arafat, right? May Allah forgive his sins, right? Um, yep. And then this guy entered into discussions in the 90s, right, with the Israelis, right? And, and is known as the Oslo Accord, right, in 1993. He then says, we want to go back to the 1967 borders. Well, people don't realize, okay, the Oslo Accord, right, which the PLO, or the representative of the Palestinians, put into motion, that was almost saying that, you know, the 78% of the Palestinian land that's been occupied by Israel, that's okay. What did the, mm. what you call the Israeli entity do? They suppressed the Ummah, they bombed them, they destroyed, you know, uh, our, uh, you know, uh, sacred sites, like Aqsa and others, right? The uh, Church of Holy Sepulchre, which belongs to the Christians, we also respect that. We also protect that. That's under the uh, protection of the Muslims. They don't give no, uh, what you call it, uh, they don't give a toss about that. So they keep taking away, they keep suppressing and persecuting our people, right? Suppressing them, right? Humiliating them. But at the same time, every single discussion and international agreement that's been put in place or a treaty, they've always taken, never given back, right? It's almost like, you know, you have this boundary, a perimeter, right, on the ground. And, you know, uh, if you've watched sumo wrestling, right, when one of the sumo wrestlers tries to push the guy over the line, he failed because he's gone over the line. And he's thinking, you know what, I've failed because... If you go outside the line, that means you've gone outside the borders and no, nowhere else to go. That's exactly, that you know, exemplifies the situation of the Palestinians and the Yumma. Israel has been pushing after every agreement, taking more and more land. Now the Palestinians are on, the, are on this line. What normalization will do is push them over the line and that's it, case closed. Israel becomes Israel, fully established, legitimized. An illegal entity becomes a legitimate entity. So to, uh, you know, to address that problem, the problem of where do we put Palestine, not the problem of the usurping state, we need to address that, is, okay, they've got over the line, normally that means case closed, but we've got Palestinians, what do we do with them? Oh, do you know what? We'll give them Sinai, right, a desert. We'll give them Jordan. And do you know what we'll do with the Saudis? We'll kickstart this project called, uh, what you call it, Saudi 2030 vision, a strategy which will develop and also fund and help build do you know, uh, this new Palestinian so-called state, right? And what people are not r realizing that even any kind of like, you know, funding that the Americans have uh, stated, that's going to come out of the coffers of the Ummah, the money that belongs to the Ummah, right? What are the Muslims actually getting in return? And the key thing to recognize is it's never been reciprocated. We've only lost. And it's not just about humiliation, right? It's you know more than humiliation. Our honor has been uh, affected and so is our land. There's a uh, there's a recent quote by Netanyahu when he said that the good news about peace, uh, the good news about peace came about because of a clear break with the failed strategies of the past. For decades, all progress was halted because of completely unrealistic Palestinian demands. Demands, he said, were complete non-starters for any responsible Israeli government. And you know these demands actually were part of the two-state solution: issues to do with the border, 
issues to do with the right of return and all these things. And these guys are clearly saying like, look, these were completely unrealistic demands, but actually these were part of the so-called two-state solution. So a, a question I have uh, that I think is worth discussing is that, you know, the issue of Palestine, we, we, we're speaking about this now, is, is this a... Um, is this a purely a, a political issue or what's the sort of Islamic stance on this as well? Because at the moment we're speaking about land and we're speaking about people and stuff like that, right? Um, is it mainly a political issue or for Muslims, is it, is it, is it greater than that? No, it's, it's definitely greater than that. And just to pitch, you know, we mentioned this on previous podcasts as well, highlighted the importance of the blessed land. Allah tells us in the Quran that this land and its this location and its surroundings, he has blessed. You know, this is the location where the mirage started. This is where the location where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was taken to and then ascended to the heavens. This is the location we know is where originally the Muslims prayed towards, you know, this is, there's so many significances to this land, this holy land, that we should see it as much more than just a political issue. We talk about it as a political issue today is because that's all we've seen for the last hundred odd years, because there's been these issues that are in front of our faces, but we know the significance of this land. Um, equally, there are other political issues that are going on across the globe. But as we know, whenever the issue of Palestine arises, it has that effect on Muslims, maybe less so now, sadly, and maybe less so in the younger generation, which is the reason for doing these kind of podcasts and doing these kind of things is to make sure the younger generation have that same affiliation, have that same bond and feel the same when they hear about something happening to the Muslims in Gaza and the Muslims in Palestine, rather than making it the same as Muslims dying elsewhere. It might be easy to say, look, Muslims dying anywhere is we should be concerned by. They are ummah at the end of the day. They're the ummah of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa However, this land has special significance. Um, and I think the reason why it's important to look at it both from a religious standpoint as well and the political standpoint is the two things are linked because the West also recognizes that this area, there's dispute over it. You know, they, they view it that way so that they say the Muslims see that this area should be theirs. The Jews see that this area should be theirs. The Christians have some affiliation to it as well. So they recognize that and therefore they utilize that, that sentiment in order to create that conflict. And that was the reason that they chose to give that land um, to the Jews when it wasn't theirs to give in the first place. And just to add a point to that, you know how sometimes Muslims might even feel a little bit sorry. And the, and the Muslims that let the Jews you know, into that land felt a bit sorry for them based on what had happened to them by the Germans. You know, so but what they sometimes don't appreciate is the Balfour de Declaration was many decades before the so-called Holocaust. 1916, yeah? I think. Exactly. 1916, 1917, the Balfour Declaration. That was when the declaration was made to give this land or homeland for the Jews. So forget about the, the Holocaust or forget about the Jews being killed afterwards. This was Muslim land that the British at the time had already designed to be used as a strategic point to cause issues amongst the Muslim world. Anybody should ask themselves the question is why is there this non-Muslim land right in the middle of all these Muslim lands? Why is there this illegitimate state? That's what they should be asking themselves. So yes, you're right. We should look at it from the religious point of view as well, because this land is blessed and this land is land that we should have extra concern for. But it's understandable that people are viewing it from a political point of view as well, because that's the environment that has been created. So, you know, uh, we see that certainly Trump, the timing of these, uh, these, uh, this normalization certainly is convenient for, for Trump um, and his re-election. You can see this clearly, right? And also he wants to be seen someone who has actually, you know, uh, left a legacy behind of actually accomplishing mm. something. You, you can definitely see this, the, the, how these things are there to aid him in his, in his re-election. However, um, what does America gain from all of this?
so just say now these countries are recognizing uh, uh, the normalizing relationship with, with Israel, right? And other countries will follow. Maybe Saudi will follow. Maybe the Palestinians will be pushed out into Sinai and 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 given Jordanian citizenship. And and at the end of the day, there will be no no one left called a Palestinian. You'll either be Egyptian or Jordanian. All of these things just say, right? What's the ultimate goal? What do the, you can probably see it from the Zionist point of view, their vision of that land and the way they link it to, you know, Judaism and, you know, but from America's, America's point of view, what's the big game here? What, what, why are they, uh, why are they going, and I'll tell you something else as well, which is important. You probably noticed this, when UAE, Bahrain and Sudan, for all of these three countries, who was it that announced the normalization? It was Trump, right? Trump, yeah. Okay, so so what's the what's what's the big deal here? What what's what's the big deal from a, yeah we see it from a point of view of Palestine is a religious land for us and stuff like that. You can see it from the Zionist point of view, but the grand scheme of things, world politics, from the America's point of view, and we know America's the one who's supporting uh, the state of Israel. We know America's pushing all this. What is their goal? What is the ultimate goal that they maybe this is for another podcast, but if you if I can get your thoughts on this, because I think this is quite interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, what is, you know, the motive from the American angle? I mean, one of the things you have to recognize, America is the sole superpower of the world, right? And it has this notion that it manages everyone's affairs and it's put necessary frameworks in place to address various different situations. And it also, also carries the torch or the candle for capitalism. I mean, on, in terms of what's the ultimate goal and the wider goal in the grand scheme of uh, things and also on the international front, what you have to recognize is... The, it's a multifaceted thing. So there's a political mm -hmm. dimension to it, there's a psychological dimension to it, and there's also an element of you know, emotional, uh, would you call it, you know, blow as well. Psycho psychologically, what the enemies of Islam and the Muslims and the West wants is to ensure that you know, they deal a blow to the Ummah at large, especially in an area where they've got the third most holiest sites if the muslims can't protect and liberate that land then what aspiration and hope do they have of trying to even trying to bring islam back to power right that's one of the things that psychological blow right uh, and it creates this vision that look if you don't listen to america and others then you can never define your own destiny that's the psychological blow mm -hmm. and that's why they've prolonged this so long right the next one is okay which it which call it feeds into is look if you guys, the Muslims, want liberation and revival, you can't achieve it. Never forget talking about the Hilafah and implementing Islam at a world level. You guys can't even protect a piece of land from even such a weak entity like Israel. You guys are trying to talk about the grand plans of establishing a Hilafah. That's the psychological blow that is trying to implement. Mm -hmm. The emotional blow is, do you know what? ideas become reality and it's right in front of your face they've done it you've seen it emotionally is which it, it, it kills you it's demoralizing politically what america wants to do is trying is trying to refocus the attention and the energies and the resources of that region to fight political islam right mm -hmm. and that's the main uh which could go and trump and others have said it and so has uh, uh the um uh the foreign minister of or uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Emirates, uh, UAE, uh, UAE, UAE, UAE. Sorry, yeah, Emirates, and that's what he, yeah, and that's what he said. And one of the things he said when he was talking to the Washington, the Washington Post, and again, these are you know the key gold nuggets that people tend to miss in order to understand mm -hmm. you know what the real political reality of this situation normalization is. He said normalizing the relationships between or relations between UAE and Israel is an opportunity for us to address you know, the challenges of the region. A number of Arab states and active non-governmental forces are defending some form of extremism, right? They are yearning for lost empires and hallucinating about a new Khilafah. Yeah. Signing peace treaties this week will be the appropriate response. What does that appropriate response mean? Prevent the real discussion from being held, right? Because like I said to you, America's sole superpower the power of the world. Right, the only thing that can challenge is supremacy and hegemony is Islam at a political or a state level. So, America recognizes that. And you know, when you mentioned at the start, Maj, it was critical that we separate the people of a nation and the regimes. 
the regimes have been orchestrated and are listening to their master, right? And America also ensures and guarantees their safety and protection only mm. if they obviously obey uh, what they say. So what and you're saying is that these, these regimes actually are obstacles to, for the liberation of like Al-Quds, for example, yes? Isn't absolutely, it? absolutely. And then even like, you know, a couple of months back, the same, Emra uh, uh, I don't know if it was the same one or if it was someone else, an Emra Emirati ambassador to Washington, and he was picked up by the Israeli uh, newspaper called uh, Yiriad Ahronoth, right? They said Islamic expansion encourages extremism and undermines regional stability, mm -hmm. right? And the Muslims, uh, j referring to their history, his, he said they have an ugly legacy of animosity and conflicts. That's how he was trying to, you know, define the history of Islam, right? And you said this an Emirati saying this? Yeah, it was an Emirati ambassador Whoa. and it was picked okay. up by the Israeli newspaper, Yediath Ahronot, okay. right? And this is what he said. So these kind of statements, they give you an idea of what are the real reasons behind this. And like I said to you, when the Ummah is addressed, it's never always just political. It's always psychological, it's emotional, because the Ummah has an Akira, mm. yeah? And from that Akira emanates you know, uh, solutions to life's affairs. And life's affairs, they take various different, you know, uh, what you call it, dimensions, such as emotional, psychological, political, because it's all linked to thought, emotions, which creates the personality, and then the environment that you live in. So that's how we need to see it. It's not just, like you said, is it just a political issue? No, it's, not, it's more than that. It's not just about, you know, trying to redefine, you know, a piece of land. It's also trying to make sure that they subjugate and suppress the Ummah and capitulate it. So a quick question then um, is that if the people that are either watching or listening to this podcast, obviously you guys have really explained, mashallah, in a, in a clear way, you know, what the, this normalization means uh, in regards to um, the two-state solution, how this is something which is totally unacceptable from an Islamic and Muslim point of view. And also um, that the fact that the issue isn't about Palestinians or Arabs or you know it's, this is a, an, an Islamic issue this is a Muslim issue so so I'm sure that uh, listeners and, and the people watching this have taken on that on board so if Palestine is an Islamic issue if this is something which should concern not just Hamas or Fatah or the you know the the surrounding Arab regimes right this is an issue of the Ummah so what what as an Ummah how should we respond to this then you know, because uh, at the moment it would seem like it has been relegated to a so-called Arab issue. And I'll give you an example. If tomorrow, uh, just say, and this ain't going to happen because of the arrogance of the, the, the Zionists themselves, but if tomorrow the, uh, they, they said, we'll give you a two-state solution as an example, right? Uh, so then your regimes like Fatah, you know, sellouts, they accepted it. Now, it could well be that someone sitting in, in, in Pakistan might say, well, if the Palestinians have accepted it, you know, if the Arabs have accepted it, then what's our problem, right? You know, sometimes I say, but what we're saying clearly is it's an ummah issue, it's an issue that concerns all of us. So as an ummah, what is it that we should be doing? What is it we can be doing? So I think it's worth discussing that. Yeah, so this, to answer this, this is linked to what Mudi was saying just a few minutes ago as well. If the, the way that America has dealt that, as, as you rightly put, this psychological blow and this political blow against the Muslims. If the reason America can do that is by being the sole superpower, they are also an ideological nation. They view what is happening in the world through that ideological lens. What that basically means is it's never just, you know, one particular issue. Let's deal with that reactively and then move on to the next one. It's always with global aspirations to ensure they maintain the hegemony, as mentioned as well, yeah? So when they see the situation in Muslim lands, it's very clear that their strategy is against political Islam because they recognize that when they're on that negotiating table and say Palestine is the, the thing that's being negotiated, if they always have the upper hand, which they have done to this point, then whoever's sitting on the other side of the negotiating table can never take anything from them because they always sit there with an upper hand. And the reason they're able to sit there with an upper hand, again, is they're being ideological. To answer your question then is the ummah at large now need to be ideological as well. To, rather than look at it and say, well, the Palestinians are happy, like you said about 
you know, this person in Pakistan sitting there and going, if the Palestinians are happy, the Ummah need to look at it and go, wait there, it's not about Palestinians here. It's That's about right. the strategic reason they want this illegal entity in our midst is to suppress us is to cause conflict here. In the same way, you know, you say the Arab regimes, putting aside the people, the regimes are the reason why this entity continues to exist. It was those same regimes that w contributed to the destruction of the Khilafah. It was these regimes that now protect Israel and in the, previously were the reasons that Islam as a political entity no longer exists today. So as Muslims, we need to be clear of that. We need to see that these regimes are part of the problem. So when people present and say, look, what is the solution to Palestine? Oh, you can link it to what's happening in France right now, for example. Yeah, the reason you can link it is because how did the Muslims deal with these issues when they happened previously? So the issue of Palestine, as Moody's already said, is when Abdul Hamid was approached to purchase Palestine, as a state, they were able to say, no way, okay, because this is, this is our land and it has significance. In the same way as they're um, speaking about our Prophet ﷺ today, and in the same way as they're putting these disgusting pictures of our Prophet or cartoons that are trying to represent our Prophet on the walls in these projectors today, how did we deal with that previously? When there was that play about the Prophet ﷺ going to be played in France. It was the Islamic authority, it was the Khalifa who was able to say, look, you better stop that play because we're not happy with this. You know what? The French actually stopped. Then that same play was then taken to London and they decided to do that play in London. And then um, Abdul Hamid sent another letter and said, look, you know, you can't, do this play because this is dishonoring our prophet. What did, how did the UK respond? How did Britain respond? They said, oh, we're not France. We have freedoms here. We're going to do what we like. Then he sent another letter more aggressively. And he said, without with paraphrasing, that he will invite all of the Muslim nation, all of the Muslims, and tell them the haughty way that you are dealing with or speaking about our Prophet and you're going to play, have this play which is going to be so disrespectful to our Prophet and I will tell them and the repercussions are out of my hands then. You know, it was a threat. And then what happened? The British, they stopped that play. So it's, it's frustrating that Muslims don't recognize that these issues are all symptoms of the Islamic State and the Khilafah not existing. These are symptoms. These aren't the root cause. Palestine being in the situation today is a, a symptom of the lack of the establishment of Islam. What's happening in France today and our sisters being stabbed in France and all of our Muslim brothers and sisters suffering in the world is because they are symptoms of a lack of Islam existing to be able to protect them. So I would say to all Muslims that to wake up and recognize that we need to re-establish that system in order that these situations that we see, be it Palestine, be it our prophet being dishonored, that's how we solve that problem. And I think that that needs to be understood by most Muslims. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Allah. You want to add to that, Mudi? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's literally like trying to distill it down so, you know, the public and the audience understands exactly, you know, what they can do to kind of like, you know, help us and basically uh, uh, to address the situation going forward. And first and foremost, right, anything that you want to do has to start with acquiring and trying to educate yourself in certain mm -hmm. matters, especially, you know, political mm -hmm. matters, because it gives you that political awareness. And it's also making sure that, you know, as Muslims, our viewpoint in life and our interests have to always be linked back to Islam, because that's our premise, right? And then the next one is making sure, you know, what's the objective that we're trying to achieve, right? We want to resume the Islamic way of life because that's the hukum of Allah and the messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Educating and then obviously linking the three of them together, the objective, the basis, which is Islam, and having that political awareness, it gives you a framework to assess, you know, the plans and the plots of the kuffar, but also how to evaluate a situation and then how do you remediate that situation so for example 
Now, I've got a framework, and when I assess something, I say, okay, naturally, all situations begin with an escalation and a struggle, right? And that is because, for example, there's a lack of trust, there's a hatred based on what ideas you carry, ideological, right? And then they tend to be nationalistic, right? So the Palestinian issue has been isolated to being a nationalistic issue when it's not. And then it's, was it for me? like the expedient tendencies right and then that's the escalation of the struggle which then has a different phase so it becomes a struggle that starts to shrink because now on the back of certain agreements goodwill enters trust enters right and understanding emerges and then it results in you know, stability and the struggle disappears right and then it's replaced with engagements and partnerships right like we see normalization right Peace to Prosperity Initiative, Oslo Accords, the Camp David Accords, etc. Right, and what this shows that when you have these kind of frameworks in your mind, that all situations, right, are temporary, right, unless the basis on which they were built was ideological, right, because an ideological battle is continuous, hakam battle, right, and it's never subject. Like I said, they've never reciprocated. We've all made the concessions. It's never subject to concessions or time, right? That's the key thing to understand. I mean, and in summary, generate, educate yourself, generate the political awareness, right? Make Islam the basis of your viewpoint and interest and with the objective being that we need to res resume Islam based on the methodology of the Prophet Sallam. And if we apply that framework to the entire international situation or even to a regional a, a, or a local situation. And inshallah, do you know what? You, Allah will help you and plant your feet firmly and help you remediate the situation accordingly as per Islam. Yeah, subhanAllah. I think, I think what you guys have said there is no point in me repeating it, but uh, it's a really practical advice for people to be, uh, to be listening because as, a, as an ummah, we do have a connection to this place and these people. And the reality is, is that, you know, um, I think Rash said the point, we need to wake up. And because if we think about it, you know, all the other things that people are doing, whether it's charity organizations and, and you know, all these looking to the UN and stuff like this, this is something which, you know, has, has just, you know, made the problem just continue and continue. And the reality is that if we apply this to our normal life, if we had a, an issue in our life, we wouldn't just let it just drag out. It was doing the same actions or, or looking, looking towards people who you know, of, as a fact, are not going to help you. But to do it continuously, continuously, continuously. And I think Rash, what Rash said was bang on, the fact that as a number, we do need to wake up. And, uh, and this, and being woke, is linked to the stuff that Muli said as well, as, you know, what's our role in all of this, in understanding this issue from an Islamic point of view, from a political point of view. And as the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you know, that the believer is not stung from the same hole twice. SubhanAllah, forget all the other issues. If you look at just at Palestine, we've been mm -hmm. getting stung time and time and time again. And, you know, we haven't woke up. But I tell you, I tell you what, the credit goes to the, the people, the Muslims of Palestine. The credit goes to them because I tell you something now. You know, a lot of people, you know, what we don't understand is that we just look at it from a humanitarian point of view, or they're suffering, they, you know, they they're hungry or they're being oppressed. Look, they we might not understand this as an as an ummah issue. They they are the ones who do understand it. They they don't even say it's a Palestinian issue. They say, brothers and sisters, this is your problem. We are here defending this land. We are defending Masjid Al Aqsa for you. Come, come to our aid. And that's the reality that those people are on the front line. And, um, you know, if we really want to do something, <coughs> then what you guys have mentioned is something which we need to ponder about and, and, and try to implement that. So, guys, I'm going to inshallah bring the podcast to a close. Um, but I wanted to just take, you know, any final thoughts that you may have to add to, you know, the loads that we've already mentioned. Um, I'll start with you, Rash. Is there any, any final points you want to add to this? I suppose I mentioned some of them in what I said previously, but one extra thing I would add is it's time for us to call out some of these people of knowledge, yeah, or the people who call themselves people of knowledge and say, it's your responsibility. You know, we might be 
people will listen and watch these podcasts and go, you guys aren't learned people. You're not scholars. You're not, you know what? We've given some practical advice. We've given the reality on the ground. We've highlighted the issues that occur. We've linked them to both Islam and politics. And if anything we've said is wrong, come and, you know, put us, put us right. But the issue is there are many scholars and imams and people putting aside, okay, may, I'm sure there are some that, cannot speak out for various reasons you know threats against their lives being thrown in prison and these things so may Allah make it easy for them Ameen. but there are there are many people who have a platform who can speak out yet they don't utilize this emotion that the ummah has for correcting these issues that the ummah is facing with that platform instead they give out these long lectures and they give out these long speeches and they say some amazing things and they have may amazing recitation but then when it comes to giving a solution they give it so watered down and they present things that makes you question whether there's even or makes a typical muslim would question whether islam even has the solutions to these problems it's crazy so and these are people who are prominent so I would be as an individual, as a Muslim in a community, as a general nobody would want to say to those people in places of knowledge, in places who have um, an, an apparatus and a platform, I, you, we should be questioning them and saying, look at the, what's happening to the Muslims in France, in China, in Syria, in Palestine. You guys have re taken on the responsibility of the knowledge of Islam present to us what we should be doing yeah show us what we should be doing in order to eradicate these problems so i think we should question them and the more knowledge we have the less they can get away with giving watered down advice yeah just like there, man. Uh, uh, there's nothing more to say other than 100 percent, 100 percent. and one one quick thing i just want to add to that is this thing that's happening in france where the a cartoon of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi is being, you know, uh, shown on buildings. Who is speak? Which who is speaking out against this? But anyway, that's another topic. Modi, is there any, any final points you want to add to, uh, in regards to this to this podcast? Yeah, I mean, very quickly, just bouncing off what uh, Rasha said, um, and it goes back to that point. Just challenge people because the issue of Palestine is not one of refugees. Mm. And their fate can't be negotiated, right? And also state uh, that, look, it's wrong for anyone to call for the integration of the Ummah, uh, especially the children of Palestine, with uh, a, an occupier, right? And it's mm. also wrong to even suggest that an alternative homeland for someone who actually owns that land in the first place, right, is wrong, right? Mm. Because... Palestine and Al-Aqsa does not belong to just the Palestinians or a few guys living in the GCC, right, or the Arab world. It belongs to all the Muslims and the issue concerning Palestine is an issue that needs to be addressed by the whole of the Ummah, i.e. the Muslims, the Muslim community at large, because their identity is Islam, right? Their land is their responsibility and the issue of Palestine is a political issue that needs to be Result collectively by the entire ummah. Yeah, jazakallah khair um, for your comments. So guys, inshallah ta'ala, we'll uh, bring this podcast to, to, to a close. And uh, first and foremost, uh, a big jazakallah khair to uh, Rush and Modi for okay. your subhanallah, your insight into this, this, this topic, unique insight. And, uh, and for all our listeners and um, uh, people watching this, uh, we did do uh, episode five of the Talking Me podcast on the issue to do with the deal of the century. And we, um, not too long ago, uh, I don't know if I remember the episode number, uh, we did a, a, an episode on how Muslims forgotten the, um, the importance of Al-Quds. So, uh, you know, we, we couldn't speak about everything. Uh, and I know Rush wants to make a quick point. Yes, Rush? No, just to tell you, it was episode number 21. Number 21, yeah. So I would really recommend checking out episode 5 and 21 because there's more information um, about this issue as well. And also, if you can like and subscribe uh, Voice of the Ummah on Facebook, on YouTube, and we and our podcasts are available on all popular podcast platforms. So on that note, 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching that video. For more exclusive videos, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Don't forget, you can listen to some of our shows wherever you are because we're also available on all popular podcast platforms. And for more Voice of the Ummah content, make sure you check out the links to all of our social media platforms in the description below.